Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I am Rehan Tahi Syed, a director for Center for Entrepreneurship and Business Incubation at Modern College of Business and Science. And I'm the moderator for today's event. I would like to welcome you all to the MCBS Chronicles and today's event. It is our absolute pleasure and honor to have Dr. Katrina on board, who is a research fellow at the Institute of International Politics and Economics, Serbia. And she works in Regional Center for Belt and Road Initiative, commonly known as BRI. Her research includes management and intercultural management, as well as business practice and economics in the People's Republic of China, commonly known as PRC. In recent years, her main research scope is Belt and Road Initiative and 17 plus cooperation mechanism. Dr. Katrina is deputy editor in chief of IIPE's journal, The Review of International Affairs. Dr. Katrina obtained title of associate professor at Faculty of Business Studies at Megatron University in October 2017, where she was teaching several subjects, which included management, organizational behavior, strategic management, and intercultural management at various levels of studies, including undergraduate and postgraduate studies. She was a director of the Chinese Center from 2013 to 2018 and the vice rector for international cooperation at the same university. Uh, I, I could go on and on. Uh, she has rich experience and vast administrative exposure across different departments and units and has been heading various initiatives. Uh, she's working with uh, both a state and independent think tanks as an expert in modern Chinese economy and BRI. Besides this, she cooperates with many Chinese uh, newspapers as commentator and has been actively sharing her research work in international conferences and events. The title for today's webinar is Perspectives and Challenges of the Belt and Road Initiative, a case study focused on Oman and Balkans. The main aim of this webinar is to present the history, meaning, perspectives and challenges of BRI. The Chinese initiative that covers almost two thirds of the world is significantly influencing the world development. Infrastructural projects, which include high speed roads, high speed railways, airports and seaports, uh, apart from energy projects, metallurgy acquisitions and joint ventures in the manufacturing and service industry are part of this mega initiative. BRI has so far achieved many successes, but the challenges are also there, and that is what will be discussed today. And uh, Dr. Katrina, with her rich experience uh, and observations through our uh, involvement in various international projects, will be sharing uh, with all of us today. The participants will also find out the opinion about main BRI projects in Oman and Balkans from the perspective of an independent third entity, who is Dr. Katrina, a Serbian researcher. Dr. Katrina, I would like to welcome you on board and I would like to uh, request you to take over the platform, share a bit more about your work, and then we proceed with your presentation. Uh, welcome, Dr. Katrina. Mr. Raihan, uh, I hope that you can hear me well. Yes. Thank you for your introduction and for the kind uh, words. I do hope uh, that uh, your students and your colleagues will also enjoy today's lecture and maybe they will uh, learn some new things about the Belt and Road Initiative they didn't know before and maybe I will inspire some of your students to maybe pursue some degrees in Chinese economy and management practice. So that is also one of the goals of today's research. Uh, before I start uh, to share my uh, uh, PPT with you, I would first of all like to thank uh, the management team of Modern uh, College of Business Studies uh, for inviting me today to speak uh, upon uh, this uh, topic. And uh, I would like to send a special thank you notes to Professor Heshan Magd for organizing uh, this event and for inviting me uh, to be present here today. And I would also like to thank my former colleague, Professor Anna Jurcic, for uh, uh, recommending me for this lecture. And I hope that her recommendation will finally uh, result in uh, good uh, things and that uh, students will enjoy uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, let me 
try to share my PPT with you. Uh, can you see my PPT? Mr. Raihan, can you see yes, my PPT? Yes, yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. So, as you can uh, see, uh, as, as Mr. Raihan said, I will speak about not only challenges and perspectives of the Belt and Road Initiative, I will speak about two special uh, case studies that are dedicated uh, to the Chinese cooperation with Oman and the Balkan uh, countries. Before I start with my presentation, I would like uh, just to use this opportunity to say a couple of words about the institute at which I'm working. So Institute of International Politics and Economics is one of the oldest uh, institutes uh, that is dealing with international relations and uh, Southeast Europe. And actually this institute was founded in 1947 by the degree of uh, the government of former Yugoslavia. In 2017, this institute became the first regional center for the implementation of research projects uh, within the cooperation uh, framework that is called Initiative 17 plus 1. And actually we joined this initiative thanks to our cooperation agreement that we have with Chinese Academy of Social Science. As uh, Mr. Raihan said, I'm currently working at the research center that is dedicated uh, to the research of the Belt and Road Initiative and throughout uh, my previous experience and throughout uh, my present ex experience, I think that I have enough knowledge to tell you about current perspectives and challenges within this initiative. Uh, let me just first of all speak about the contents uh, that uh, we will I will present today. First of all, I will speak about the origin of the ancient Silk Road. After that, I will speak about the establishment of the new Silk Road, how it was proposed, what are its main goals, what are the perspectives, what are the challenges. Uh, the third topic will be about cooperation between Oman and China, and the fourth last one will be about the cooperation uh, between China and Balkan countries uh, under the Belt and Road umbrella. After that, I will give you my final remarks, and I hope that we will have enough time to answer some of your questions. So let's first of all start with some pictures and some uh, stories about the ancient Silk Road, how it started and what was the main idea uh, uh, under this road. As you can see on the first picture, we have uh, actually the presentation of the ancient Silk Road, how it started and where it went. So the beginning point of this ancient Silk Road was actually in the city Xi'an, that is situated in the Shanxi province. And from that center, and that was actually the capital city of the Han Dynasty, 200 years BC, from that point, uh, the road uh, led to Asia, uh, Middle Asia, Middle East, and it was finally reaching Europe. As you can see on two other pictures, traders from China and Asia, and of course Europe, used all different source of transportation sources that they could have at that time. So for example, they used elephants, they used camels, they used horses to transport goods from China to Asia and in the final point to the Europe and vice versa. If you look upon this map, even in nowadays, you can see that this part of the route is extremely difficult, that if you want to cross China and then went to Middle Asia and uh, Asia and Middle East and Europe in the final point, of course, you're going throughout different terrains. You're going throughout deserts, throughout mountains, different rivers, and it was very difficult in those days to finally reach the Europe. What does this mean for this route and what does it meant during that time? It meant that the traders actually for China, from China, didn't travel the whole route to reach Europe. They were selling their goods to one point and then after that the commodities and the products that they were selling changed the hands and then the different trader sold that goods to the second one. Uh, in the final end it 
resulted in a very high prices of the commodities that are traded between China and Europe, but actually the demand for them was very high, and this was the reason why this route was so successful. So, as I said, this route uh, started in uh, 200 years BC, and it lasted until almost half of the 19th century. So for many, many decades and many centuries, people used this usually continental route to transport their goods from China to Europe and vice versa. So what were the products that China sent uh, to Europe and what were the products that were in high demand? As you can see on this picture here, you have the example actually of the silk moth or somebody calling them silk box. So these are uh, actually the silk fibers that are finally in their last point uh, used to produce silk uh, fibers and to produce silk textile. So the origin of the name of this route actually comes from this article that was in a high demand all over the Europe, but also in Asia. For many decades, China kept a secret how to produce silk fibers and how to produce silk. It actually gave them, even in those days, competitive advantage because other nations, other countries didn't know how to produce silk. And in that way, China could even in those days gain like an export sufficit between uh, different countries. So it was a very important article and it actually it is even in nowadays very high uh, uh, demanded article, even when we all know how to produce uh, silk. So how did the Europeans actually uh, found out how to produce silk? As I said, that was a well-guarded uh, secret. Not all of the people in China knew how to produce silk. Uh, actually, only a couple of thousands of people knew how to do that. So there is, from some historical sources, and actually a story that two Byzantine men actually uh, went disguised as Buddhist monks to China spent a couple of years in China, learned how to produce silk, smuggled silk bugs uh, to Byzantine Empire, and that was actually the time when the Byzantine Empire and European nations learned how to produce silk. Of course, many different countries and uh, people within Asia learned before Europeans how to produce silk, for example, people in India, but actually that was the time when the Europeans finally learned how to produce silk. Besides silk, what were the commodities that were sent towards Europe? Of course, China or porcelain was in very high demand. After that, we had tea, spices, uh, precious stones. Jade was actually among those things that were traded between China and Europe. What were commodities coming from Europe that went towards China? Actually, uh, China imported even in those day horses because horses coming from Europe were taller, they had more stamina, and also horse equipment was in high demand in China. Besides these articles, uh, Europe sent towards China uh, glass projects, uh, sorry, uh, glass products uh, sent also wool and honey. So as I said, until mid of the 19th century, this route existed. And the main reason why this route stopped and was not used were actually uh, the problems within uh, Chinese territory. So in actually 1842, China lost a very significant war, and that was the Opium War that it led uh, with the United Kingdom. During that time, China, due to war reparation, lost one part of its territory that we now call these days called Hong Kong, but it didn't only lost part of its territory, it, it lost almost uh, its internal peace and internal strength. So during uh, next uh, century, China had different uh, internal problems. There was the rise of the Communist Party. The last Chinese empire was taken down by military government in China. China led several wars with the Japan, after that, China joined the Second World War, ended the Second World War as a, one of the allies and as a victory party. But unfortunately, until 1948, it didn't establish peaceful environment. In 1948, finally, Communist Party gained the leadership over China and uh, Mr. Mao Zedong was appointed as the first Chinese president. 
actually in a couple of days, or should I say on 1st of October, China will celebrate its National Republic's Day. And that was the day that was uh, used in the modern day history as the starting point of PRC. During Mao's residency, many things were changed within China because China was struggling for many years with different things in those horrifying years. It was struggling with poverty, it was struggling with hunger, it was struggling with many different things. And Mr. Mao Zedong tried to solve part of the problems uh, that were connected uh, to China and tried to, in a way, um, make uh, China strong country and try to make a new development economic model that will help uh, the poverty and to be eliminated and help the future development of this country. As I said, in some things he succeeded, some things were good, some things were not good. And actually the development of today's China as the number two economy in the world started in 1978 with the appointment of Mr. Deng Xiaoping as the, at that time, Chinese leader. Uh, when Mr. Deng Xiaoping was appointed, he undertook new economic development model that was not uh, present during Mao Zedong's time. And actually, he founded the reforms that were called open door policy. And during that time, China opened to international capital, it opened to international knowledge, it, it opened to international working force. So, these reforms eventually led to several different steps that in the end, throughout all these successors that we have at this uh, slide, helped lead China to the development that we have nowadays. Uh, this is actually a very wide topic, the, the development of China, and unfortunately, I don't have enough time to speak in the details about that but many uh, of you can find online very good articles and books about the Chinese economic development model if you want to pursue that topic even more. So we are finally reaching the point in 2013 in which Mr. Xi Jinping was appointed as the Chinese president. And actually you are at this slide looking at the historic actually pictures from his speech that he delivered in Kazakhstan in September 2013. During his speech at Nazarbayev University, actually Mr. Xi Jinping presented his idea about the revival of the ancient Silk Road and the invention of the new Silk Road that will nowadays in a modern way help connect nations coming from Asia, Africa and Europe. One month later, in Indonesia, Mr. Xi Jinping presented the second part of this initiative that is called Maritime Road. So just to stress out for those students that are not so quite acquainted with this uh, topic, I need to stress out that the name of this initiative nowadays is Belt and Road Initiative or shortened BRI. But actually at the beginning, Chinese government used the terms New Silk Road or one Belt, One Road initiative. But if you want to write your articles, uh, uh, publish some papers, please do use uh, Belt and Road initiative as a term. On the next slide, you can see actually the countries that are part of this initiative and how it was proposed by China. So you can see, thanks to the ancient Silk Road, there is a same beginning point at the uh, continental part of this road. And actually that is the city Xi'an, that was the capital city during the Han Dynasty. So as you can see, this continental part goes from China, goes uh, to Asia, Middle Asia, Middle East, and it's finally reaching Europe. And on the other hand, we have the maritime road that goes from China, goes to China South Sea. Uh, then we are going throughout different ports, different uh, seas, different oceans going throughout Africa, Middle East, and finally reaching Europe. So those are the roads for trade. But what are actually the goals of this initiative and what is the Chinese government doing by implementing this initiative? I just need to emphasize one thing be before I go into a further explanation of this initiative, that uh, Chinese government is always stating that uh, Belt and Road Initiative is in complete alignment 
with the policies of leading organizations and the China has their support for this initiative, uh, such as organization RG20, United Nations, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and so on. So China has been signing cooperation agreements with individual countries and regional organizations. And this is the reason why China believes that this uh, initiative will succeed in its uh, final results and final ideas. What are the main projects that are done under this initiative? As Mr. Raihan already said, this is a mega project uh, that is actually uh, in a way uh, helping produce different kinds of things. And one of the main things that will be done under BRI umbrella is to make new infrastructure connections, whether they are roads, railways, airports, ports, bridges, it doesn't matter. China also wants, by using this initiative, to promote energy cooperation and also to make a better cooperation in the communication field, especially in the field of 5G networks and optical cables. Also, China is a big supporter and firm believer of globalization as a process. So China does not want uh, to go outside of the globalization process as a whole. China wants to improve in a way it can this process and it wants to, in a way, have better results coming from this initiative. And e-commerce is, of course, one of, one of the main points of this initiative. For the purpose of this initiative, China either established or used a previously established uh, institution that will, of course, finance this uh, initiative. Probably many of you do know that China will use financial package that is worth 1 trillion US dollars. And for that purpose, China will use, as I said, two financial institutions. One is uh, Silk Road Fund and the second one is Asia Infrastructure Investment Banks. As Mr. Raihan said, nowadays more than two thirds of the countries all over the world are participating in this initiative. According to the new reports coming from China, at this moment we have 138 countries that are part of BRI and 30 different types of organization, international organization. So what are the projects that China is currently conducting within this initiative and what we can say about them. Actually, it was very difficult to make this slide and to present you all the projects that China is currently conducting. And actually, it is impossible to do that. What I did try, uh, I did try to present you the projects that are most significant ones and to which China is actually referring when they are trying to explain what is the main purpose of BRI. So as I said, railways are very important part of the trade. And of course, uh, many uh, different companies and different countries do send their goods towards railways and high speed railways are in high demand. So actually, China is at the moment currently conducting different uh, railways, the construction of different railways such as railways between Jakarta and Bandung in Indonesia, between Abuja and Kaduna in Nigeria, between Ethiopia and Djibouti, and the final one is between China and Laos. Regarding seaports, China is currently constructing or rebuilding several ports. The first one is Colombo port in Sri Lanka, then we have Piraeus port in Greece, after we have Dorolech uh, port in Djibouti, Zebriš terminal in Belgium, Maura in Brunei, and Gwadar in Pakistan. Uh, three bridges are in uh, focus right now uh, regarding BRI in China. The first bridge is built in Brunei, the second one is built in Croatia, and the third one is built in Bangladesh. Regarding roads and highways, uh, China at this moment already built or is some stage of the construction of more than 60,000 kilometers of different kind of uh, high speed roads. And actually the countries that used uh, mainly the loans that China is offering for those projects are Serbia, Montenegro, Pakistan, Uganda and Jamaica. China also have invested in shares 
leases or expansions in several international airports, such as Heathrow Airport in London, Toulouse Airport in France, Frankfurt Airport in Germany, Tirana Airport in Albania, and Maribor Airport in Slovenia. I just choose a couple of pictures to show you how uh, some of the projects within BRI are looking like and what did China achieve with them. Actually, Port Piraeus, that is a port in Greece, is an excellent example of good cooperation between China and the European countries. Many of you do know that in 2019, Greece had uh, did several uh, uh, problems uh, that happened due to financial crisis. Of course, uh, financial crisis was the final and reaching point in the Greek financial crisis. It didn't happen uh, uh, thanks to a financial crisis, everything thanks to that. But of course, that was one of the troubling uh, things that happened to Greece at that time. So Greece, as an EU member, reached out to European Commission to try to find to seek the help. And of course, the EU helped uh, China to escape uh, almost bankruptcy. Unfortunately, that was not enough. And Greece tried to seek uh, different opportunities in order to improve its economic development. And one of the opportunities that was uh, presented to them was actually an opportunity to cooperate with China. So China sent its uh, state company called Costco to lease uh, one part of Piraeus uh, port in uh, 2000, I believe, nine. And during that time, uh, they reached agreement that uh, China will finance the, uh, how to say, the infrastructural uh, construction of this port. Uh, China will send their companies. Uh, China will, of course, give the money. And they will try to rebuild this port. And of course, uh, Greece working force will work in this port. And uh, actually, this was a very good example of successful cooperation because in previous time, this port was not used in a good way. And actually, nowadays, this port is one of the most important ports in Europe, meaning that this is the number three port in Europe today. The second uh, picture is actually a picture of the bridge Pelješac in the country that is called Croatia. Croatia is actually the neighboring country of Serbia from which I'm giving you lecture uh, today and sending my regards, of course. And uh, this is the bridge that was very important to Croatia because actually it helped uh, uh, bypass and connect two divided shores of Croatia. But what was the problem with this bridge? You cannot see from this picture, but this part between those, those two shores actually belong to the second country that is uh, named Bosnia and Herzegovina. And Bosnia and Herzegovina felt that this uh, bridge will ruin its opportunities for the transportation of goods. And actually, uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina say, sent a complaint to the European uh, Commission for building this uh, bridge. Unfortunately, European Commission decided that Bosnia and Herzegovina was wrong. They denied their appeal. And of course, the European Commission granted Croatia as one of its members loan to build this bridge. So actually, a Chinese state company called China Road and Bridge Company built this uh, bridge. And actually, you are currently seeing the model how this uh, bridge will look up in the future. One of the most controversial uh, projects that China is conducted now is the Colombo port in Sri Lanka. Many of you do know that uh, former Sri Lankan government had some difficulties with Port Hamantota, in which China uh, participated in construction and of course gave the loan to the Sri Lankan government to rebuild this port. Unfortunately, that Sri Lankan government was unable to pay the debts that it owned to China, and they finally reached some kind of solution in which China will continue uh, to improve this port, but it took 99 years of lease of that port. So it was a huge question, will the new Sri Lankan government continue to build the second port within its territory? And after some thinking, Sri Lankan government agreed to continue and to pursue 
the development of this sport. And the final picture is showing you actually how the future railroad between China and Laos will look like. And as you can see uh, throughout different projects that are present to you here today on these different pictures, Chinese company are doing their best to build different bridges, ports, railways that are going throughout very different terrains. And you can see this terrain is a very difficult one. And I hope that uh, the final result will be good uh, both for China and both for Laos. Many students, first of all, do ask questions. Why did China introduce this initiative at this moment? Why, if it's so strength and strong, why didn't suggest this initiative early on? Well, actually, many things needed to happen before this initiative was implemented or suggested to the uh, public. Uh, first of all, China needed to strengthen its economy. And as I said, different Chinese presidents led to huge results. As I said, China was an underdeveloped country. It was a country that was developing uh, very slowly. And uh, with the economic reforms that Mr. Deng Xiaoping introduced, China finally started to change its economic uh, environment and way of developing. And after many decades of two uh, of double digits um, growth rates of GDP, China finally reached one of its goals and China became the second largest economy in the world. And of course, uh, whenever one country has enough money and uh, geoeconomic power, it is also gaining geopolitical power. So that political shift of uh, presentation of China in uh, uh, world environment led to implementing and suggesting this kind of initiative. Also, uh, China used a lot of its money uh, to invest in a military force and by uh, combining all these three elements together, China of course achieved to become a superpower that nowadays it has. Also for many decades, uh, China was a country that was trying to resolve many disputes that it has in uh, its own environment with its neighbors. In some of those cases, China did succeed and China solved some problems. With some countries, uh, the problems are still continuing and China is still negotiating and trying to find peaceful solution. But for many decades, the peaceful transformation of Asia Pacific region meant that China can develop its economy in peace and after that uh, uh, develop uh, part of and send part of its attention towards international environment and international development. So the combination of all these factors lead to the uh, historic speech of uh, Mr. Xi Jinping, but there was actually one more thing that in a way helped introduce this initiative at the moment that it was introduced. So as I already said, financial crisis in 2009 hit many countries very forcefully. Of course, you do know that this financial crisis started in the USA and that those countries that traded and had many investments coming from the USA were hit, were hit hardly. So, uh, countries coming from the European Union and Japan felt that crisis very deeply. Of course, uh, that opened space for China to intervene in the international market and of course, in a way, gain competitive advantage against all these rivals. As we already said, one part of this lecture is dedicated to the perspectives of this initiative and I used official Chinese terminology in a way to uh, show you what are the things that China wants to achieve uh, with this uh, initiative. So when you look upon official documents, you will find that China finds that this initiative will be a road to peace. It will be a road to prosperity. Uh, China do thinks that by uh, implementing and giving money in the form of loans or uh, different type of investments. China will help development uh, of different countries and especially countries in Asia and in Africa. 
So I do know that uh, modern college of uh, business and science have many international students coming from different countries. So if you are coming from the countries from Africa or uh, Asia that are not developed in so good way, uh, those of you do understand these kind of initiatives and these kind of perspectives. But some other countries and some other nations that are more developed and uh, are have been developing for many centuries, they don't, don't find this initiative good and prosperous in a way that some other countries do. Also, according to the Chinese government official documents, this is the road to green development. China is, of course, one of the biggest uh, polluters in the world still, but actually China has been doing everything that is in its power to uh, put a lot of money into the uh, sustainable development and green research. And actually, uh, China is the number one country in the world that is pursuing uh, green development and uh, different patterns that will help those uh, green development. Of course, this is a road to innovation. This is a road to uh, uh, connecting people from all over the world and trying to achieve uh, uh, cooperation that will result in win win results. So actually, this slide is one of the main points of this uh, presentation. And I'm glad uh, that Mr. Raihan said that uh, myself as a researcher coming from Europe and coming from a country that is not an EU member, that is trying to become an EU member, I may give some kind of perspective that is not usual one. So I'm neither uh, a Chinese researcher, I'm neither EU or the US researcher. So I think that I do understand from my position both sides and then I can give perspectives coming both from China and from the Western world. So what are the challenges uh, that are in a way uh, introduced coming from different people and different researchers from all over the world. What they are using as their usual narrative for this initiative. Many of them do say that BRI is the road to Chinese domination. Some of them say this is the road to debt trap. And in final cases with a very negative narrative, some of them do say that this is a road to a big mistake. Why this kind of narrative and why they are saying this? What they imply uh, throughout this in narrative is that China is using its geoeconomic strength and all the money that it has to provide different countries with different kinds of loans that will be implemented in a different uh, projects. We saw already what are these types of projects. And Ch China will do that with their companies and with their working force. While I do understand uh, their point of view and I see what they are thinking, and I hope that you also understand that point of view, I would like to stress out a couple of things. So. China is in a way giving the opportunities uh, to different nations to pursue different kinds of projects. Uh, China, you can do that willingly. Uh, China is not forcing you to take those loans or to take those projects. Uh, coming from the country that it was in a very bad economic situation for a couple of decades and that had many internal struggles and that still even though it made many reforms, is still not part of the EU. I want to emphasize a couple of things. Even though we tried to change many things, and in many things we succeeded, we tried to pursue different financial institutions and different uh, grants and loans that were coming from the EU to, uh, in a way, make different kind of infrastructural projects. For some of them, we couldn't find any other help, either the help coming from China. So China actually suggested some new initiative and some new projects that were okay for us and that we willingly, in which we are willingly participating. Many other countries that are actually part of this initiative, 
do not have enough uh, money, uh, do not have enough knowledge or equipment of the working force to make all these uh, uh, different type of infrastructural projects that are part of this initiative. Some of them they do have, but those countries they, that don't have any other solutions, they of course went towards Chinese loans and uh, Chinese credits in order to pursue in a way their dream. And let me just give one more example for the students that are trying in a way to navigate this geopolitical or geoeconomic research and trying to see who is right and who is wrong. So you are currently students. I do hope that some of you will actually soon finish your graduate studies. And let's just imagine for a brief moment that some of you might want to buy their own flat. They want to leave their parents, they want to leave their family nest, and they want to be in a way alone. So what you will do in order to pursue your dream to have an apartment or a flat? Of course, some of you will have enough money. Many of you will not have enough money. So we'll, you will take all the money that you have and of course try to seek uh, a help coming from different banks and different institutions that can borrow you the money. What will you do in the end? You will look upon all the options that are presented to you and finally you will choose the bank that is giving you the best options. The same case is with different countries and their projects. So each country needs to look upon their current situation, their perspectives. They need to see what is China offering, what are other financial institutions offering, and finally see in which way they will conduct their projects. So China is not forcing anybody to participate in this type of project. In my opinion, coming from, uh, as I said, a country that is uh, not an EU member and coming uh, from uh, a place as a researcher that can, of course, see different kinds of points coming from the western part of the world or the eastern part of the world, what are the challenges that I think are important in regards to BRI? First of all, can you imagine to be in a place of Chinese government and not only conduct your economic development, but also to, in a way, negotiate all different types of problems that can occur between China and 138 countries? In my opinion, that is a huge headache. Of course, the gains are great, but it is difficult even when you have a company, when when you have 138 people to navigate that company? Or can you imagine one multinational company that has people coming from 138 countries to navigate them and manage them? Do all those people have different uh, cultures, uh, different way of thinking, different religions, different beliefs, and you need to navigate all those things to have positive results in the final end. So these are the actually challenges that I think that will, that are of course at the moment happening and that will happen in the future in regards to these projects. Of course, each and every country that is part of this initiative has different laws and different way of conducting business. So when China is uh, coming to those countries and investing in them, it needs to, in a way, listen to all demands coming from the host country and adopt to them. Also, one of the things that I think will be important for the future development of this initiative is the uneven development within China. So maybe you have learned, I'm speaking now to the students that are part uh, of uh, this uh, college and that are of course learning different things, I do hope that you did learn about the uneven regional development of China and that you do know that the eastern part of China is more developed than the western part and northern part of China. So one of the ideas behind this initiative is trying to, uh, in a way, uh, push the development of China 
from eastern part of the China to the western part of the China. And China was succeeding in that. It doesn't mean that these parts of the China are now uh, in superior where developed uh, more. It means that they are in a better position, but China also needs to find out better solutions for the problems that it has in its own territory. Of course, one of the problems and of course challenges that will happen uh, whatever time it is, are the security challenges and the disputes that many uh, countries that are part of this initiative do have. So I think China is trying peacefully and throughout different negotiations to pursue many projects, even with the countries that don't have uh, good relations. And uh, of course, two final points and uh, two final challenges that will in a way affect this initiative is the external challenges and cooperation of China with the European Union and with the USA. It was planned last year uh, to have a huge government meeting between uh, Chinese uh, government officials and the uh, EU officials in September this year. Uh, and that uh, uh, meeting uh, was actually in a way uh, made and appointed uh, in order to solve many disputes that the European Union has with uh, China. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this meeting will not happen and we just need to wait and see uh, how this uh, pandemic will continue and how China and the EU will solve many issues that they have on, the, on their table. The second part of the story is the cooperation between China and the USA. Uh, many of you do know that uh, China uh, has a trade war with USA that is of course implemented by the USA and I think that the elections in the USA that are coming in the next couple of days in the USA will definitely influence uh, the final trade disputes uh, between China and the USA and how they will be solved. Of course, I think that one of the biggest cha challenges nowadays uh, will be the pandemic uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, solving. And uh, I think that if we succeed in, uh, in a way fighting against uh, this disease, the soon we will recover a world economy and we will all be in a better position and not only China uh, with uh, BRI. So we are finally reaching the third part of our story that is dedicated to explanation of relations between Oman and China. And I just need to point out for uh, people who are joining this webinar and they are not coming from Oman, uh, that uh, China and Oman uh, made an agreement regarding BRI just last year. So it means that all the development projects that you will see on the next slide uh, were part of their cooperation in previous uh, years. I need to stress out that Oman and Muscat port were actually very important link of the ancient Silk Road and that for many decades people coming from Oman and China had very good relationship. But the relationship, especially the diplomatic relationship, was improved in 1978 when China opened up its territory to foreign investments. And I think, uh, judging by the Chinese government official statements, that China thinks that Oman is among its most important partner in the Middle East and the partner on which it can uh, most uh, rely on. I need also to stress out that I'm not an expert on big projects in the Middle East. Uh, I do concentrate my research more on the Central and Eastern European countries and the Balkan, but I tried for the purpose of this lecture to look upon the projects that China has been conducting in Oman. And there are several projects uh, that are presented here you on this slide. And I think those projects will finally result in a good things. First of all, you have the picture of Al Dakan port, and I think that port is very important for uh, Oman in a strategic sense, because I think that Oman, like many other Middle Eastern countries, is trying to pursue different types of economic development that are uh, not relying so much on the exploitation of gas and 
Napoleon. So it means that uh, Oman is trying to achieve different things and trying to improve its economic development by relying on different types of industries, such as tourism or uh, food production. And I think that there are uh, many negotiations currently going on in this field between uh, China and Oman, how they can improve this relationship even more. As I said, this al Dakan port is very important and uh, judging by the reports that I found in uh, Oman uh, uh, papers and the different kind of research papers, articles, uh, there are uh, six Chinese uh, private companies uh, and there is actually a consortium that is pledging to invest 10 billion US dollars in, the, uh, in this port in different kind of the projects. Also regarding this Aldakan port, Ningxia, New Energy Technology Management uh, Corporation made a joint venture project with Oman Investment Fund and together they invested 94 million US dollars in a solar power project. Besides this, uh, Silnalite uh, invested 300 million euros in the construction of sugar refinery and processing plant at the port Zohar. For me, it was then very interesting to see that actually uh, China State Grid Corporation, that is one of the largest and biggest uh, Chinese state companies, made an acquisition in Oman and currently they are owning 49% in the biggest electricity producer in Oman. Besides uh, this, uh, China National Petroleum Corporation has extended a contract for developing an aged oil field in Oman for another 15 years and the first contract was signed in 2002. As far as I can see from all uh, the reports that I read and articles that I read, I think that uh, the cooperation between China and Oman is uh, uh, going into the right direction and that Oman as a country went throughout all different stages in which China is, for example, developing uh, its relation with one uh, country. For example, regarding investments, uh, when uh, China starts to invest in one country, usually it sends its state companies and trying to invest in the state company in that country. The second phase is when China sends their state companies and private companies to invest in the private companies in the host countries. And the third phase is when China sends private companies to invest in acquisitions or greenfield investments. And that is the final phase of their, uh, how to say, cooperation. So I think uh, that Oman is actually having at the moment excellent strategic development strategy and I think that uh, you can uh, even uh, improve more your cooperation with uh, uh, China under the Belt and Road Initiative umbrella. So we are reaching the final part of our presentation and I tried, uh, of course, I am very aware that not all the uh, people who are joining us today do know where are the Balkan countries, where we are positioned. And I tried to put one bright yellow spot in order for you to see where is Balkan Peninsula located. As, and as you can see, we are part of the Europe. You are here and I'm sending you my regards. And as you can see, there are a couple of countries that are situated on Balkan uh, Peninsula. And the names of those countries are Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Greece, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Romania, Serbia and Slovenia. This is a more precise a map of the countries that are located on the Balkan Peninsula. And this is the capital city from which, from Serbia, from which I'm uh, speaking to you today, uh, this uh, webinar. And I do hope that uh, after we finally succeed this pandemic, that many of you, whether you're professors or students, will visit Balkan countries. I do hope that you will enjoy your time in the Balkans. I, of course, do like my country very much and I do like Balkan countries and I think they are excellent countries to visit. So please, when uh, we finally finish COVID-19 pandemic, do please come here and try to enjoy your time here. On the next uh, uh, picture, you have the picture of the countries that are EU members within Balkan Peninsula and with other uh, colors, you have countries that are not uh, EU members. So what is the economic uh, situation in those countries, how they are performing nowadays? 
you have two tables uh, that are in a way telling you the main information about those Balkan countries. The first table is uh, dedicated to gross domestic product in current prices in billions of US dollars from 2010 until 2018. And the second one is even more important because it is telling you the gross domestic uh, product per capita. So, of course, I don't have enough time, but I just want to briefly stress out that countries that are part of the EU, of course, are performing in a better way. So most developed countries within Balkan Peninsula are, of course, Slovenia and Greece, and after that, Croatia and Romania. And the countries that are least developed are Albania and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Serbia is somewhere in the middle. So this is this slide is actually part of my research that was published uh, last year and actually I tried to see if the Belt and Road Initiative in a positive way uh, in fact affected uh, China's cooperation with the Balkan countries and for that purpose I used the China Global Investment Tracker database that's not the best one but it's the only one that we have at the moment. And actually, I tried to look upon all the projects that China has in the Balkan countries before and after Baton Road Initiative was established. Uh, actually, that database uh, publishes all the data uh, about uh, not only Chinese investments, but Chinese loans, acquisitions, joint ventures, whatever. So we tried to look upon the project that are, as I said, above 100 million US dollars and try to see uh, if Belt and Road Initiative affected this kind of cooperation. And judging by this slide, I hope that you can clearly see that the Belt and Road Initiative, Initiative positively affected the cooperation of China with the Balkan countries. But I do need to stress out that, of course, part of this uh, initiative and part of the good results uh, were uh, connected to the different uh, uh, to a second uh, Chinese initiative that is called 17 plus one. And that is actually initiative between China and Central and Eastern countries. What are the sectors in which China is investing in the Balkan countries? As you can see, the situation is uh, similar as in Oman. So, of course, they are investing in the infrastructure and in energy field. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is a significant increase in regards to the investments in the service sector. We have the biggest increase there. Of course, the absolute values are still very low. But it means that uh, China is after some years of uh, actively pursuing projects in transportation and energy field, now pursuing projects in service fields such as tourism, entertainment, technology, logistics and so on and so on. Uh, I uh, can uh, in a way say and I think that in the next period, of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, that China will, of course, invest part of its budget in health in those uh, countries. So this is the map, of course, of the Balkan countries uh, in which I tried to show you uh, what uh, the number of the projects that China has in uh, different Balkan countries. Uh, uh, Albania was not included in uh, this analysis because all the projects were uh, below 100 million US dollars. But actually all other countries uh, had projects uh, that are bigger than that. In regards to number of the projects that China has in uh, these uh, countries, Serbia is the leading one. We have the biggest number of the projects so far, but uh, regarding the absolute va value, uh, Greece is the leader, especially due to Port Piraeus, in which China so far invested almost six billion uh, US uh, dollars. And this is the final slide for today. I would like to give my final remarks uh, with two Chinese proverbs that I think in a good way uh, explain Chinese way of thinking and Chinese way of developing. And they, I think that both of them can be useful to you as a student and as people who are pursuing their careers and people that want to chase their dreams. So the first saying goes like this. Be not afraid of growing slowly. Be afraid of standing still. And the second one goes like this. The journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. What are the meanings 
between besides these uh, proverbs. And I think that each of you, of course, will understand each of these proverbs in its own unique way. But for me, these proverbs are in a way explaining Chinese way of thinking and Chinese way of pursuing their goals. Uh, you need to be brave and to make a first step. You need to make a risk. You should not stand still. You should fight for yourself. You should try to achieve better and good things in each of your lives. And I think that China, especially regarding its nation and its people, succeeded in pursuing its goal. As I said, China had so many internal struggles and so many internal problems. And I think that finally, uh, even before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, started, they did achieve many goals that they wanted uh, to solve. So in the end, of course, I would like to thank all of you that were present today at this webinar session. I do uh, like to give you my email and of course if you are interested in part of the things that about whom I spoke today, you can visit my ResearchGate profile. You will find many articles that are uh, published uh, in English language. And also I would uh, like to in a way greet all the professors that were here today. And uh, as a deputy editor of uh, the journal, uh, within my institute that is published in the English language that is called the Review of International Affairs. I would like to uh, ask all of you that are dealing with international relations, that are dealing with international economics, to send us your research papers and I hope that uh, this lecture is actually the first uh, part of our, how to say, uh, um, way of cooperating and I hope that you of course enjoyed this lecture. Mr. Raihan, the floor is yours. Uh, Dr. Katrina, thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed a lot of uh, information and more importantly learnings, not only to students, but also we have professors, researchers on the platform today, including me. And I see already a, a lot of potential areas of collaboration in terms of research, especially since uh, Middle East and uh, in particular GCC, uh, still, uh, there is lack of uh, research based uh, outcomes uh, for uh, further collaborations and business, uh, you know, initiatives. Moving forward, uh, I have been bombarded with questions, uh, but more importantly, uh, there are many comments and I share the sentiments. Apart from the questions, uh, this webinar was excellent. Uh, I'm just trying to read out a couple of, uh, you know, comments here. Interesting, excellent, uh, informative, insightful. Uh, I stand by all these terms. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your detailed research and more importantly, a well-structured presentation, which uh, really gave a lot of uh, inputs for our understanding and also for further research. Moving forward, I would like to pick up on a few questions. Uh, I sincerely request attendees and I seek apologies if I'm not able to cover all the questions. Uh, I, I know a few minutes ago, I promised I'll try my best, but we have paucity of time. Uh, Dr. Katrina has already shared her email ID. I kindly request you all to, uh, you know, uh, directly get in touch with her in terms of questions. To begin with Dr. Katrina, the first question here, and it's not a surprise, uh, from your research perspective, uh, do you think China will continue to grow as it has been growing uh, post uh, COVID-19? Well, that is an uh, excellent question and a question uh, actually uh, that is uh, very significant and uh, I was asked a lot uh, about that situation and I was even brave enough uh, to give my perspectives in March uh, this year when the COVID-19 pandemic started because uh, I, I gave an, uh, a TV interview about COVID-19 pandemic and what I think would happen. So bear in mind that was in March. Now we are at the beginning of the September. Things are looking more brightly than they were in March. But I have a different perspective, I think, than most of the people that are commenting on, on uh, Chinese economic development after COVID-19. Uh, as you said, for more than 13 years, I have been dealing with Chinese economic model and Chinese economic development. 
Uh, but unfortunately, during my PhD studies, I was not uh, able to go to China and to see firsthand everything that was going on there. Uh, after I fi finished my PhD, and after I became the director of uh, a Chinese center within in my former institute, I went to China. And when I finally went there, my eyes were in a way completely open. Uh, it means that I saw many things that I couldn't conduct, you know, by just uh, reading articles or reading books or reading reports. You need to go to China and to experience China firsthand to understand China. Because when you go there, you can see the determination, the optimism, the hard work of the Chinese people, you know, and they have such a, a, a kind of discipline that in my country is very difficult to perceive. So we are not disciplined in that way as a, as the Balkans. So when I finally reached China, I understood how they developed. And I think that part of the answer to your question goes in that uh, uh, regards. So in the uh, last two months, uh, the data coming from the China are actually telling us the Chinese uh, economy is in slow process of recovering. I didn't look upon the data for a month, but I can uh, tell you what is happening uh, at the moment in uh, Europe. So we had a huge crash. So many of us presumed that the uh, learning curve uh, after this COVID-19 pandemic will be in a uh, 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 letter. So you have sharp decline and then you have sharp rise. Unfortunately, that is not happening at the moment. So the crisis is deep and it is affecting everybody, you know. So it's not like it just happened in one region. It happened all over the world. And I think that uh, China, uh, in a way, is nowadays trying to fix everything that happened during pandemic uh, in regards to its economics. Uh, also, I uh, did uh, read uh, the speech uh, coming from Mr. Xi Jinping that he gave, I think, almost one month ago, in which he said that uh, China will, of course, first of all, try to stabilize its own economy. And of course, uh, uh, due to different, uh, how to say, shortages in chain links that we have nowadays, thanks once again to COVID-19 pandemic, China is trying to pursue its uh, cooperation more with the Asian countries, neighboring countries, so countries that are in its uh, region. So I think that China will use this opportunity to seek its uh, weaknesses and to improve those weaknesses into its strength. And I am very optimistic in regards to their future development. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Katrina. Uh, next, just to summarize two questions, because uh, they seem to be uh, overlapping uh, in terms of the essence of the, uh, you know, the question itself. Uh, considering uh, GCC in general and Oman in particular, uh, and China, uh, they are geographically, demographically, and more importantly, culturally uh, poles apart, uh, even with the aspect of religion. Uh, where do you see uh, this partnership moving ahead? What is your vision from a researcher's perspective? So if I understood you correctly, you're asking me about the cooperation between China and uh, Gulf countries, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, as far as I can see, uh, with some countries, China has better cooperation uh, uh, than with some others, you know. So clearly, uh, some of the Gulf countries are actually uh, more, uh, how to say, optimistic in regards to Belt and Road initiatives. Some of them are very, not to say pessimistic, but careful in regards to cooperation with uh, uh, China. I think that Oman actually is a good example how should you pursue your cooperation with China, because it started uh, slowly, and then gradually it went up. It means that after some time, those two countries did re rely upon them. They were in a way loyal one to them and they had a good cooperation regarding different projects that didn't happen overnight, you know, and it sl starts slowly and it goes up. And I think, as I already said, uh, uh, different countries in the Middle East are pursuing strategy of development that is not um, so connected uh, to the exploitation of oil and gas. 
And of course, in your neighborhood, you have different countries um, that are doing different things. I think that similar things to Oman, and sorry if I'm not uh, completely okay with that. As I said, I'm not an expert in the Middle East, but as far as I can see, for example, United uh, Arab Emirates have the similar economic uh, strategy as uh, uh, Oman. I was uh, lucky enough to uh, visit uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi in 2000, unfortunately 2009, when the economic crisis happened. I went that month there and I could see uh, firsthand uh, in uh, that two cities how the financial crisis was affecting the economy of uh, that uh, country and those two cities. So uh, I think that uh, each of these countries in the uh, Gulf region, as I said, uh, must uh, make, in a way, SWOT analysis. So what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are uh, good things that you can use coming from the international environment? And what are the dangerous things that you need to put away or in a way skip? So as far as I can see, the cooperation is good. It can, of course, be even better. But of course, that is up to each individual countries what kind of cooperation they want to have with China. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, moving ahead, uh, there's one question related to the port, uh, Dukum port in Oman, and it connects to, uh, to the point you shared about uh, Port Piraeus in Greece. Uh, fortunately, I was able to visit it last year uh, when things were all normal, as we call, uh, tend to call and remember uh, fondly. Uh, do we see a replication of uh, that particular result in Oman too? Not quite, not quite, uh, because uh, Piraeus port was leased to mm -hmm. China and still is, and it will be leased for a couple of years. Uh, Oman is not nowhere nearby Greece, and you are lucky enough <laughs> that <laughs> your your government was not in that kind of. Uh, dangerous financial situation but but what we can learn uh, we can learn that when you have enough faith in the project and when two parties are negotiating in a good way you know uh, that cooperation also didn't happen overnight so the cooperation started very slowly with a small part of port that was given to chinese company okay. and after that that cooperation was widened. And this is the reason why we have results nowadays with Pireusport, that is number three in the Europe. If you look upon the data before China took the operation in this port, if I do remember correctly, it was ranked as 98 in the world, okay. Pireusport. So can you imagine uh, how, in which way the functioning of this port was improved? So regarding Oman, uh, I see that Al Dakan port is a different sort of port, and it's uh, you have different type of projects that you want to achieve within port. So Greece port is just a port for cargoes, nothing else. So China does plan to have uh, some other things within this port, but not at the moment. So it's only used for car cargo and ships and transportation. So I think uh, Oman project is bigger, larger, and I think if uh, those two sides negotiate carefully, what are the projects that they want to produce? I think that for Oman, uh, but not only for Oman, it's, it's, it's important for every country nowadays with the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to have uh, food security. You need, in the, we, we saw it firsthand, how food security is important. It was never important like these days, and energy security. So luckily, Oman has high level of energy security, but it doesn't have high level of food security. And I think, for example, uh, that is the uh, part of cooperation that you can improve. Just, there's just an idea. I don't know if there is any kind of project that Oman is pursuing in those regards, but I think that would be also very good for Oman. Okay. Thank you. That was insightful, Doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, uh, this is with relations to the equations countries have with China. For example, the US-China trade war and the escalating tensions between India and China. 
uh, has left the neutral countries like Oman uh, in a dilemma. Uh, considering the fact that many countries uh, have had economic relations uh, with US and India. Uh, how do you see uh, these uh, situations impacting economics of uh, all the countries uh, we're talking about? Well, uh, I would suggest follow the example of Oman. <laughs> Why? Because uh, Oman is actually the country that is doing that in a good way. Uh, Oman is friends with everyone. You know, you have US investments, you have investments coming from the European Union, you have investments coming from India, you have investments coming from China. So you are an example how with good diplomatic relations you can solve many problems. Uh, uh, that kind of problem that you are telling about, Serbia is experiencing in a, how to say, difficult way because Serbia is a country that is a, not an EU member and we want to become an EU member. So mm -hmm. can you imagine our place at this time between the EU and China? China, uh, according to not only government official statements, is our friend, you know, but we are also friends with the European Union. 70% of all direct investments in Serbia are coming from the European Union. So European Union is our the biggest trade and investment partner. We are located within Europe. We want to belong, we belong to Europe, but uh, we also want to be friends with China. We want to be friends with India. We want to be friends with the US and more importantly, we want to be, be friends with Russia. So what we are trying to pursue, as uh, you already mentioned in your question, is to find some path of neutrality, you know, of course, we want to become an EU member. We are doing everything we can to become an EU member, but until we are actually an EU member, we can pursue different ways of cooperation with different countries. Uh, doctor, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, and that, that's a lesson for all of us. In fact, Oman has been a, a classical example uh, over the decades, in fact, uh, trying to maintain good international relations with uh, the rest of the world. And I'm sure that is a good model to be practiced by different countries. Moving ahead with a couple of more questions here. Uh, what is uh, the future of uh, BRI? Considering the fact that uh, apart from the BRI, the China Chinese economy itself is dependent on globalization. But now countries looking inwards and uh, self-reliance being, uh, you know, the political tool uh, and more importantly, trying to become independent. How do you see from uh, economics point of view this uh, having an impact? Well, I'm enjoying this question so much, you know, <laughs> th thanks to all the participants that sent uh, such an interesting uh, questions. They're inspiring me in a good way to answer to all of them. Actually, it is not how to say popular opinion. But in my opinion, globalization that we knew so far, uh, thanks to this pandemic, will be changed. So even if you look pre-COVID time, the last 10 years, we had so many economic problems all over the world. And uh, I think that each economist that I know that is dealing with international economy is trying to see if there is some kind of different model that we can develop in the future to solve all the problems. Because we saw, of course, that neoliberal capitalism and neoliberal economy is the only, vibe, only one that survived for so many years. Others that we pursued, such as socialism, were not functioning. We do not know how to make a new, another one that will function in a better way. So I think that, of course, uh, this kind of, uh, how to say, economic development models will change. So what is the future, uh, not only of BRI of China, but and also the self-reliance? Yes, you're correct. And not only you, but all the people that sent the questions. Self-reliance is, I think, nowadays most important, as I said, uh, food security and energy security. Those are the two things that I think uh, each government needs to solve out immediately. And the third one is health resources. 
So uh, I don't know when this pandemic will be over. I do hope in one year. That is my prognosis. I'm not quite sure. I don't have any inside data, but that is something that I, I, I can see from this point of view. I don't think that all the vaccines will be ready and that we will just be immune all to this uh, coronavirus and things like that. So self-reliance, very important. Uh, also, what is important? Uh, I need to stress one thing. Uh, in 2019, uh, when you look upon the level of BRI projects, the level of the investments was decreasing. And before the corona started, uh, I think many of the economies that are following BRI thought that uh, the level of investments for surely will go slowly down. Nowadays, when we have COVID-19 pandemic, and that is important thing in all these things that we are uh, speaking about, I think that uh, many countries do think what we will now do with BRI projects. Can we pursue them if they are good for us? Or will they in these times when we are so weak help our economic uh, development? And as I said, each and every country needs to make its own analysis. And the people that we either choose on the elections or appointed as a government officials uh, must be very aware of the burden that they have on their shoulders at this moment. So I do not envy them. They are in very complicated uh, situation, but of course they're on those positions because they can deal with those kind of problems. So I think that in this year, we will for sure see the decrease of BRI projects, level of investments, for sure. Uh, I don't think that we will have a decrease of trade because as far as I can see, the numbers went sharply up after May and also after June. So I think that trade will recover. Not all the investments will be so strong, but I think as soon as we finish with this pandemic, that China will of course try to uh, pursue even more uh, goals within this initiative and that it will put more money into different kinds of projects. Okay. Thank you, uh, Doctor. I know we have already taken a lot of your time, uh, beginning with our pre-live session, then the live session. Uh, one last question, if you can permit me, please. Uh, this question uh, is regarding uh, what can Oman as a country uh, take away from the Chinese development? Uh, you, your core research area has been BRI, but you have been a competent authority with regard to Chinese economy. Uh, three takeaways uh, which Oman can adapt from the economics point of view moving forward uh, with 2040 vision, which focuses on economic diversification and moving away from oil dependence. What are the three uh, you know, main areas or initiatives which Oman can replicate uh, with the tweaking into local context? Well, actually, I will sum that up in just one word. And uh, I think it's uh, in a way good for Oman and that I think my country needs to pursue because uh, we were pursuing that kind of model in former Yugoslavia and it proved very successful. Unfortunately, when we went from socialist development to capitalist development, we completely forgot what we learned in the previous times. And that is not good. You need to learn from your previous experiences. So strategic planning, strategic planning, and once again, strategic planning. So uh, if you look upon the history of Chinese development, uh, you will see that China made its success thanks to strategic development and strategic plans. So each plan lasted for five years. And each five year, China selected things that it wants to focus. On. So you cannot focus on everything. You cannot pursue all things. You just need to say, oh, at this moment, I'm so sorry, but we cannot help you. And that is difficult for many people, for many regions inside of the China. But they said, we cannot help you at this moment. We need, as, uh, that's uh, the thing that Deng Xiaoping said, we need to pursue the development of the East Coast. And when we develop East Coast, then we will pursue the development of uh, other parts of the country. So I think for Oman, ports are the things that are the most important one. And I think that uh, so far as I could see, uh, there is a 
a huge development of those two ports that I mentioned, Aldakam and Sohar. So I think this is a very good thing. So when you strategically plan and say, okay, in the next five years, we want to develop ports, but also we want to develop one type of food industry. Dates, for example, or uh, corn or wheat, whatever, it doesn't uh, matter. So for five years, you're just focused on that. After five years, you're finished. You need to be prepared to go to the next phase and develop uh, different things. So I think uh, that is not only a lesson for Oman, that is a lesson for everybody. You need to think, as Chinese say, 100 years in the future. So uh, you're not thinking about these generations that are currently living on Oman that have, for example, your students, how old they are. 19, 20, 21, 22. So you're not thinking only about them. You're thinking about their kids and grand, uh, grandkids, what they will do in Oman in the next 100 years. So I think careful planning uh, and be honest to yourself. That's the biggest problem. Be honest to yourself. What, in which fields I'm good, in which fields I'm the best, and then I will pursue my dreams. Perfect. I think uh, we should, you know, rely on the competitive advantage we have uh, as a nation uh, moving forward. Dr. Katrina, thank you very much. I would like to sincerely apologize uh, the participants if I have missed out your questions. Dr. Katrina is available on her email ID. She's also active on LinkedIn. I'll share uh, the message and uh, her profile where you can directly connect with her for any collaborations on research or publication in her journal which she heads and more importantly uh, for uh, international and inter-country collaborations. I would like to once again uh, extend my sincere gratitude to Modern College of Business and Science for these uh, series known as MCBS Modern Chronicle series which have been insightful and Dr. Katrina definitely has uh, added value. The next uh, upcoming up series includes uh, Dr. Mr. Mike Robinson uh, on September 30th, 4.30 p.m. Oman time. Uh, kindly request you all to, you know, uh, register yourselves so that you don't miss out on these exciting uh, and informative uh, series of lectures and webinars. Uh, thank you one and all. Have a good evening and a good night.